I'm going to take a look at uh, another point by T.S. Eliot today, Sweeney Erect. Um, it's from his book of poems called Poems from 1919, and uh, it's one of his rhy rhyming poems. These rhyming poems are famous for for the music, really, their musicality, also their use of difficult vocabulary, famous for their satire, um, the use of music and lengthy words to create a satirical content, and this one is no exception. The title is Sweeney Erect, so we're back to this character Sweeney again, <coughs> the kind of modern man that uh, Eliot obviously deprecates and uh, thinks the world has reached a point where there's nothing, no heroes, there are no heroes left except people like Sweeney, nothing to celebrate anymore. This is a guy, a poet, who's grown up on the classics, on Homer, on Shakespeare, and now he has to talk about Sweeney as the suitable representative of the modern age. There are no, there are no heroes left. So, it's a satirical title, obviously. Um, Sweeney Erect clearly has sexual connotation, and it also refers to, to man as Homo erectus, the, the walking chimpanzee. Um, so Eliot always emphasizes Sweeney's bestiality, his similarity to the apes, and that's what he's doing in the title here. So to begin with, I think I'll just try to read the poem and then say a few things about it. So here we go. Sweeney, Sweeney erect. Paint me a cavernous waste shore. Cast in the unstilled Cyclades, paint me the bold and fractious rocks, faced by the snarled and yelping seas. Display me Aeolus above, reviewing the insurgent gales, which tangle Ariadne's hair and swell with haste the perjured sails. Morning stirs the feet and hands, Nausicaa and Polytheme, gesture of orangutan, rises from the sheets and steam. This withered root of knots of hair, slitted below and gashed with eyes. This over o, cropped out with teeth, the sickle motion from the thighs. Jackknifes upward at the knees, then straightens out from heel to hip. Pushing the framework of the bed and clawing at the pillow slip. Sweeney addressed full length to shave, broad bottomed pink from nape to base, knows a female temperament and wipes the suds around his face. The lengthened shadow of a man is history, said Emerson, who had not seen the silhouette of Sweeney straddled in the sun. Tests the razor on his leg, waiting until the shriek subsides. The epileptic on the bed curves backward, clutching at her th sides. The ladies of the corridor find themselves involved, disgraced, go witness to their principles and deprecate the lack of taste. Observing that hysteria might easily be misunderstood Mrs. Turner intimates it does the house no sort of good. But Doris, toweled from the bath, enters padding on broad feet, bringing sal volatile and a glass of brandy neat. Sorry for the pauses sir. I couldn't quite see part of the text. Um, yeah, so it's what I said, full of musicality and... and uh, obscure vocabulary used in a kind of humorous way to aid the music of the piece and emphasize that this is satire. Um, if we go back to the beginning, it starts with an invocation to the, to the, uh, to the mythological Greek world. It's a, it's a kind of scene from Homer. So let's find that first stanza again and just take, take a look at it. Um, paint me a cavernous waste shore. Um, yeah. Sorry, I had some problem. problem 
Nyeth. Paint me a cavernous waste shore, cast in the unstilled Cyclades. Right, the Cyclades then is where so many of the mythological adventures in the Greek world took place, particularly the Odyssey, of course, with Odysseus or Ulysses going home after the Trojan War and they're having all these adventures on islands in the Cyclades. So the poet is saying, paint me, paint me a picture of the mythological past and the heroes that, that, that populated that world, like Odysseus in the Odyssey. Um, paint me the bold and fractious rocks faced by the snarled and yelping seas. Find this part now. Yeah, faced by the snarled and yelping seas. So again, he's he's talking about paint me this and paint me that. Create me a scene full of heroes from the past, <coughs> full of people like Odysseus and Agamemnon and Achilles, and amazing men from the past, who, who we still talk about today and inspires art. Instead, he has to talk about the modern man, and the modern man is Sweeney, who apparently is, a, the name is taken from, from the Penny Dreadfuls, the character of Sweeney Todd, the demon barber. Um, yeah, it just briefly goes on with the classical uh, References, so the next stanza begins, Display me Aeolus above, that's the god of the winds, the Greek god of the winds. Uh, reviewing the insurgent gales, which tangle Ariadne's hair, and swell with haste the perjured sails. So Ariadne was daughter of King Minos of Crete, most people know about the, the Minotaur, and Theseus uh, had the job of killing the Minotaur and getting out of the maze. And Ariadne was a king's daughter. She fell in love with him and gave him the, a sword and a, a ball of thread to find his way out of the maze. And when he successfully killed the Minotaur and escaped from the maze, he took Ariadne with him and escaped back to back to Athens with her. So this is why he refers to the perjured sails, because he's running off with the king's daughter in much the kind of way that uh, Paris ran off with, with Helen. So, yeah, these are early references to, to, um, to Greek mythology and what used to be the heroic past, but now in the modern age, we don't have real heroes anymore, we just have, we just have Sweeney. So now we get into the actual content of the poem and what it's all about. And from this point on, it's fairly straightforward, I think. Most of the time, it's just a narrative. Sweeney finds himself in a brothel. It seems to be morning. He's, got, he's gotten out of the bed and he's shaving. Morning stirs the feet and hands, Nausicaa and Polytheme. This is a reference to two characters from the Odyssey again, kind of juxtaposing them satirically with Sweeney and the prostitute. Nausicaa and Polytheme, gesture of orangutan, rises from the sheets in steam. This withered root of knots of hair, slitted below and gashed with eyes. This oval o cropped out with teeth, the sickle motion from the thighs, jackknives upward at the knees, then strengthens out from heel to hip, pushing the framework of the bed and clawing at the pillow slip. So it gives a fairly bestial uh, picture of Sweeney uh, satisfying his lust with the prostitute, and then he's out the bed and shaving, Sweeney addressed full length to shave, broad bottomed pink from nape to base, knows a female temperament 
and wipes the suds around his face and then to uh, okay the birth is a reference to Emerson this, the length and shadow of a man is history said Emerson who had not seen the silhouette of Sweeney straddled in the sun so he wouldn't have thought that shadow was history if he'd seen the shadow of Sweeney then back to Sweeney shaving again tests a razor on his leg waiting until the shriek subsides the epileptic on the bed goes backward clutching at her sides so okay there's a lot being packed in here it seems that the prostitute is also also an epileptic and she's having a fit while Sweeney is shaving he doesn't seem to be very bothered he lets her get on with it and uh, he's just testing the razor on his leg while she's while she's screaming he couldn't care less really um, however the the other people in the house hear what's going on and come to help the ladies of the corridor find themselves involved disgraced go witness to their principles and deprecate the lack of taste observing that hysteria might easily be misunderstood Mrs. Turner intimates it does the house no sort of good Mrs. Turner is the hostess uh, presumably but Doris, Doris is a prostitute who appears in several of these poems but Doris toweled from the bath enters patting on broad feet bringing sal volatile and a glass of brandy neat so the last part of it is just a story really about what's happening in the brothel and uh, Sweeney satisfying his uh, sexual urge and without any kind of feeling or emotional connection to the prostitute when she's crying out for help having an epileptic fit he couldn't care less really and just goes on shaving and uh, this is what we call an interesting occurrence in the modern world or the, this is, these are the sort of things we describe in the modern world because there's nothing more interesting or heroic to, to describe if it, if, it was, if it was the Cyclades you'd have all sorts of stories, heroic stories about Odysseus and Nausicaa and Polypheme and Ariadne and Aeolus to talk about but, but now in the modern world there's nothing to talk about except Sweeney and the prostitute on the bed having an epileptic fit um, so there is this juxtaposition there there's an element of snobbery which anybody will perceive easily as well even Elliot himself doesn't seem to be very bothered about the about the uh, <coughs> prostitute having an epileptic fit and uh, you have to question if this is really the most interesting thing you could find in the modern world this is obviously his take on it there are probably other more interesting things he could talk about more things which more similar to the kind of heroic past that he <coughs> spoke of at the beginning but he really has his own agenda here and he wants a reader to contrast the, this heroic Greek mythological past with the modern world, the modern wasteland where there's nothing to talk about except, except the banal <coughs> and things like uh, this with uh, characters who are not worthy of respect or worthy of being talked about but there's nothing else to talk about so you have to but like I just said really it's an agenda because there would be more interesting things to talk about if Eliot had a different point of view but his point of view is to show how impoverished the modern world has become in contrast with the heroic past and in terms of doing that this is this is a, a job well done I think there are 12 stanzas here it's uh, the 12 quatrains rhyming A, B, C, B just one rhyme in every in every stanza some of the rhymes are like half rhymes 
giving a modern a modern touch. There's a lot of assonance, assonance and alliteration. Um, um, paint me a cavernous waste shore. Um, cast in the unstilled cyclades, a lot of assonance, a lot of alliteration, vowel rhymes and consonant rhymes. And as always, Elliot shows himself the consummate master of of of, of uh, the use of language and and how to put language together in interesting ways. So another technical tour de force. Whether you agree with him in terms of his point of view will have a lot to do with your view of the modern world, I suppose, and also of the Greek mythological world, the old heroic past. So that's all I have to say about this. Thank you.